Welcome back. This lecture is going to continue our discussion of Old English, um, and we're going to focus on just the phonology aspect of Old English, the sound, some of the sound changes, some of the features of what the spelling looked like versus the pronunciation, what the IPA would have looked like during this time, things like that. So with phonology, we'll notice throughout the lecture that the sound system of Old English is pretty similar to what we have in present day English, but there are a couple notable exceptions that we'll talk about. Um, and because spelling was not standardized at the time, a lot of people were, were writing things how they would pronounce things. So the spelling is going to more closely correspond with our pronunciation. You'll notice that a lot of the IPA symbols are going to correspond pretty well with what we see written down um, in the transcriptions that we have for Old English. You'll notice that the vowel system, however, compared to some of the sounds that we'll see in consonants, is quite distinct. So Old English did have long and short vowels, something we no longer have. There are also a couple of vowels that are no longer found in present day English, and we'll talk about that. There are some notable sound changes that happened early on in Old English that have affected some of the features of English pretty profoundly, and so we'll talk about that. And we'll look at a little bit of the poetry structure as well and how distinct it is from what we see today. So when we're looking at phonology, we'll start with looking at some of the consonants. And when we're looking at these consonants, Old English does retain most of the consonants that we find from Common Germanic. So what we were seeing before as those sounds were changing, um, what we listened to when uh, comparing Indo-European with Common Germanic, you may have noticed that Common Germanic already sounded a little closer to English and had some sounds that were more familiar. A lot of these sounds will still maintain themselves in English, though we'll have a little bit of a distribution change. We'll see them in some different places. There are a few new sounds also that are introduced into English during this time period that were not found in Common Germanic. So this would include our voiceless postalveolar fricative, the sh sound. And then both of our affricates that we have in English today were brought in during the Old English period. So our post alveolar voiced and voiceless affricates, the j and ch sounds, also came into the language during this time. There were some letters that we see today that are no longer used, that, <clears throat> that we use now that were not used during this time. So letters like V and Q and J were not yet found in the writing system themselves. Um, the letter Y that you see in the writing system in Old English was a high front rounded vowel, which is how it's also represented in the IPA. So that E sound um, is going to be represented in the spelling with a Y as well as in the IPA with a Y. Um, most of all of the consonants that we have today in present day English do appear at least as allophones in Old English. So even if the system itself didn't have them as separate phonemes at the time, almost all of the sounds that we'll see um, in Old English are at least allophonically uh, found then um, that we have today in present day English. There are a couple exceptions though, and that's our je sound and our glottal stop. These sounds appear much later in English. We don't see them until the influence of French and other languages. And so the j sound appears much later. It's still relatively uncommon today. This is why we don't see something like minimal pairs between j and something like sh, the voiceless version. The glottal stop also shows up much later in our time frame for English. And this is still a relatively uncommon sound in most dialects. It occurs mostly just as an allophone. We don't really see it in a lot of places um, as a sound on its own. Really the only good example that we can provide of where it would and really be an allophone distinction is something like uh-oh, where you have that glottal stop there. But most of the time it's replacing something like a T um, in something like kitten, um, where you're using the glottal stop instead of a T. But during Old English, we wouldn't have had either of these sounds yet. You'll notice that there's going to be some correspondences with how we pronounce things and how you see things spelled in Old English as well. So there were long consonants as well as long vowels in English um, in the Old English time period. And so the long consonants were usually written just with two of the letters showing. So to rain, rinan, um, would just be spelled with one N, but to flow, rinan, would be spelled with two N. So you'll notice that most of the time when there's a long consonant that they write out both of those consonants together to show that it's longer. Consonant clusters were things that we did pronounce completely. So kn and gn, um, we would pronounce both of those sounds. And this does not go away until much later in English. So kni, would, if we have a K and an N next to each other, we would pronounce both of those sounds. The hu sound um, is a voiceless W sound, so it's represented in the IPA with an upside down W. So instead of saying why, saying something like why, um, you can kind of think of Family Guy sketches between Stewie and Brian, the cool whip 
kind of joke um, is sort of making fun at this voiceless version. Um, and this was a sound that we did still find in Old English. Now we only really find it in a couple of dialects, usually sort of older dialects or extremely wealthy dialects, you might still see this um, occasionally. Um, and so that's part of the reason why you see some of that in the Family Guy sketches is that it takes place in New England. New England is one of the places where you might find that sort of old money dialect where you might still hear some speakers using something like that. There are also a lot of the graphemes, the writing system that does correspond really well to pronunciation. And a lot of these are similar to what we see in present day English. So p, b, t, d, k, m, n, l, n, are all sounds that the letters look very similar to the IPA pronunciation. And so for some of the kinds of comparison between the spelling and the IPA, you'll see that there's a lot more of that one to one correspondence in Old English than what we see in present day English. There are some different allophone differences and distinctions, though, that are important to note when we're thinking about what this sound system actually looks like. So if we think about our velar consonants, the spelling of the letter C that we see in Old English can be pronounced a couple different ways. So it might sound like a K sound as a velar sound, or it might sound like a CH sound. So most of the time you'll find it as a K, so if it's before a consonant, if it's next to back vowels, but it'll be a CH if it's next to front vowels. So that palatalization is happening when it's coming next to those front vowels. The letter G in the writing system has a few different pronunciations as well. So sometimes it'll be G as the sort of default, but it could end up being pronounced like Y or as R. And so the R sound would be between back vowels, and we'll also see that after L and R sounds. The Y sound is going to happen typically at the beginning of a word before high and mid front vowels. So again, some palatalization happening here. Um, it can happen in the middle of two front vowels, and you'll also find it sometimes after front vowels at the end of a syllable. So something like the word day that we now pronounce with a Y at the end, day. Um, as a diphthong um, would have been spelled with a G at the time, and it would have still been that Y sound and not a G sound. Um, our velar N does happen allophonically, so this is very similar to present day English, where the letter that you see as N will either be pronounced alveolar as an N or velar as N. So it'll be N if it's before velar sounds like K or G, and it'll be N anywhere else. There's some other um, important consonant distinctions to note as well. So in the spelling, you'll notice that SC is often um, in the spelling system, but this was pronounced together as a SH sound. So when you see those two letters together, it's not S or SK. It's actually the SH sound that's represented. And then the C and G next to each other is something that you might find in some of these examples, and that's a J sound. So that voiced affricate is where you'll see that with the CG spelling. And one of the major distinctions between Old English and what we see in present day English is that fricatives were only voiced as allophones in Old English. So we had f and s and th, excuse me, the interdental fricative th, and they were only voiced when they were surrounded by voiced sounds. So f would end up sounding like a v if it's between voice sounds, and it'd be a f anywhere else, or they would still maintain their voiceless nature if they were doubled. So a double consonant would mean that each individual one isn't actually surrounded by voiced sounds. So the double consonants of these would also be pronounced as the voiceless ones. And the spelling system, you'll notice that the th sounds, we're not really using t and h in the spelling system to represent these sounds in Old English. You'll see an ev symbol or you'll see a thorn symbol. And so this will be pronounced as a the sound when it's surrounded by voice sounds, just like the other fricatives. And it'll be a th sound if it's elsewhere or if it's doubled. And you'll notice that the, there's a lot of inconsistency with the use of those in the spelling. And we'll see that as we're going through different examples of Old English. And then finally, the letter H in the spelling has a few different ways of being pronounced as well. So it's actually more default as a r as a h sound, excuse me. Um, but it'll be H before vowels, it'll be H before approximants and our nasal N. Um, it'll be a, k, 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 a palatal fricative if it's after front vowels. So again, palatalization is a very common feature in the allophone variations that we see in Old English. And then it'll be h elsewhere. So in the h as in Bach, um, a sound that we no longer have in English, but that was relatively common during the Old English period. So if we look at the Old English consonant chart, and on Blackboard you'll have the um, 
handout that you'll be able to use to look at this as well. You'll notice that it looks relatively similar to our present day English, but you'll notice that there isn't the glottal stop, there isn't the voiced post alveolar fricative. There are a few of those additional sounds like the velar fricatives um, and the palatal fricative. We have the voiceless uh, velar, uh, labiovelar approximant, but most of these sounds are relatively similar, and a lot of them will correspond pretty closely with the pronunciation, aside from those different sort of allophone variations that we just saw. The vowel system, on the other hand, if we look at this chart, you'll notice that there's some differences, and it almost looks like there's two charts next to each other, and this is because we had short vowels and we had long vowels. So the long vowels are typically represented with a macron on top, so that long line that's at the top of any of the vowel symbols, where the short vowels would just be taking the place of a single vowel, how we would normally say them, how we would expect to hear them um, in present-day English. The long vowels would take twice as long. So in the IPA, you'd use a colon to represent that. In the spelling system, they're often using that macron to, to represent that. So you'll see an I with a long thing over it if it's E instead of E. Um, and you'll also notice that we have that high front rounded vowel. So the right side would be rounded, the left side in this chart is unrounded. So we have the E sound, where, which is like an E, the uh, short I, but it's rounded with your lips. So E, E, E would be the sound that that one would make. The others you'll see are uh, similar to the ones that we still have in present day English. And then we have a couple of diphthongs that are also either short or long. So there's a uh, mid front to mid back, so ao or ao, and then mid front to low, so ea or ea. Um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about some of the changes that happened with those vowels um, as well. But one of the major changes that happened, so we know that vowels can be very fluid, they can be very difficult to um, track because the changes tend to happen much more significantly than sometimes consonants do. And there is one major change that did happen in the early Old English time period that affected a lot of things that we still see in today's English. And so this is known as a front mutation. So we know that vowels are generally less stable than consonants. There were a lot of changes between common Germanic vowels and even the beginning of Old English vowels. And and so the mutation that we'll talk about, which is just a change in a vowel sound that's brought about by another sound. Um, so in this case, it's a sound in the following syllable. And so this front mutation is something that's actually having happened before we have any written evidence of Old English. And it appears to be shared by all of the West and North Germanic languages. So most of the Germanic languages would have undergone this process. So very early on in the, in the sort of English timeline. But the Gothic texts that we see don't show any signs of this having happened. Um, and so Gothic is the East Germanic language that's no longer spoken, um, but we do have a lot of text data from that, and it shows no signs of this. So it's assumed that this change probably happened a little bit later, sometime after this, um, so maybe in the 6th century or so. Um, but we don't actually know exactly when this took place. We just know it was before the written um, evidence of Old English came about. And so the way that this mutation worked, it, it's also known as IJ umlaut um, because it was triggered by an E or a Y sound in a following sil syllable. So if there was a stress syllable, so this is typically at, at this point at the beginning of a word because that stress shift took place at the end of common Germanic. If it's followed by an unstressed syllable that contains E or Y, then the vowel of the stress syllable was either fronted or raised. So it's either moving up or it's moving um, forward because of that high front nature of the E or the Y sound. So this would have affected the mid and low front vowels, this would have affected back vowels, and this would have affected diphthongs. So it's basically any of the vowels except for the high front vowels that already exist because they're already high in front. But one of the interesting things about this pattern is that the resulting sounds, the resulting form, doesn't show that E or Y. It sort of combines together to move that sound either forward or up. And so we don't actually see it showing up in the, the resulting word. But we can compare it with words that are similar in the language. So if they were a different case or if they were a different uh, number, for instance. And we can also compare it with other languages like Gothic that didn't undergo this change to see what we would have expected if there hadn't been this mutation. So what typically happened is that after a front mutation, the E or the Y would just drop completely, or in some cases it would change to an A sound instead.
And so there's not really an easy way to determine which words have undergone mutation and which haven't unless you do comparative analysis. And so that's one of the important things that those historical tools will offer us is that it lets us look at this comparison to see which words would have actually changed and which didn't. So Gothic is one of the languages through comparative analysis that helps find this. Um, so in Old English, we have dom and daemon, which I'll show you on the next slide as well. Um, and this corresponds with Gothic doms and domnyan. So the Gothic one in the uh, second example did not undergo this change, but we see it having undergone the change in Old English. So through the comparative work, we see lots of patterns of this happening, and we can come up with a pattern for what kind of changes are actually taking place. So with the original vowels being uh, mid or low front vowels or the back vowels or the diphthongs, the resulting vowel was sort of dependent on what the original vowel would have been. So a and a would have become a. So the non-mutated example slain in Old English, slagen, would have been slega. Um, the word man, so man versus men. So you'll notice here that the plural is different and this is because of that um, inflectional ending that had the e or the y in it that no longer shows up in the word because it's sort of mutated into that, that resulting vowel. So some of those really important things that you'll notice like plural changes are that we still have today are as a result of this front mutation. And so you can see lots of other examples. So O became A, whether long or short. Um, this was one that would originally have rounded, um, have moved forward before the rounding um, went away. Um, and so by the time we have any documentation from the West Saxon dialect, which is where much of our Old English documentation comes from, it would have also already unrounded by that point. And then you'll notice that things like U are becoming U, so it's maintaining that rounding and just moving forward. A is raising to E. And then all of the diphthongs are also becoming the E sound. So ailed for old versus ilder for older. And so you'll notice that there's some of those distinctions. So ailed for old versus older um, is giving us some of the changes that we see even in present day English. Um, and then the other diphthongs, things like beodan to offer versus beat it offers, where you're seeing this mutation as a result of some sort of inflectional morphology. And this, because of this change, it did have a really big effect on the morphology in Old English, and we'll focus on morphology in the next lecture. But to give a few examples of this is that for nouns, especially in one particular noun class, the nominative accusative singular foot would be fot, and now the plural is fate. And this is because there was an E sound in the dative ending and in the nominative accusative plural ending. So the dative singular foti or the nominative accusative plural fotis would have affected that and given us fate instead of fot. And the mutation would affect that vowel, but then not affect the vowel in something like fot in, for the singular because it didn't have an ending that had the right environment for that. So a lot of these plurals, things like men, feet, teeth, geese, mice, are all a result of this front mutation process. So we can see how this mutation that occurred very early on in Old English is something we still preserve in our language today. With adjectives, this created some distinctions between things like the comparative and the superlative forms. Most of these we've sort of regularized by now. Um, so the word strong versus strengra versus strengest. So the a versus the a in the comparative and superlative forms. We've since sort of regularized that in present day English to just strong, stronger, strongest. The only other example of this comparative that still remains is using elder and eldest for old. Um, and that shows that this change took place. But those are alongside things like older and oldest that have also regularized. And then there were some verbs that went through some of these changes as well. So this is where we get some of the intransitive versus transitive changes, where verbs that were originally created by adding a suffix that would have began with an e or a y sound um, would be undergoing this process. So this is where we get in instances like lie versus lay, fall versus fell, sit versus set, is because of this change that took place with one of the sound, one of the words, but not with the other one. So to sort of sum up some of the other changes that are still notable um, in phonology in Old English, there were long and short vowels, but it's unclear exactly what kind of quality distinction they may have had. So for the purposes of what we'll use, we'll just maintain the same quality. So E versus E 
where you're using the same sound, it's just longer. But there are some accounts that might suggest that the short vowels were actually lax vowels and the long vowels were actually tense. This is something that's often postulated because of how we manifest our vowels today. So e and i are distinct vowels in English um, today, but it's unclear if that distinction would have been something that had an actual quality distinction like e versus i, or if it was just a length distinction. So for the purpose of what we'll be doing, we'll just maintain that there was just the same symbol, the same quality, whether long or short, because we don't really know for sure, and we don't have strong enough e evidence to suggest otherwise, but we have evidence that there were short and long vowels. There was also a general reduction of diphthongs during this time period. Um, in the major diphthongs, ea and eo, um, we see it very early on becoming ea with a schwa. So even though schwa isn't really a vowel in the system, it's already sort of becoming a little lazier and becoming the schwa. And then eventually that just drops by the beginning of Middle English anyway. Um, and then a few other uh, diphthongs that you don't see very frequently, they're not in the chart because they're not really commonly seen, are things like ie, which became e, and eo, which very quickly became eo, one of the diphthongs that we do see, which became ea, and then would have undergone those same kinds of changes as the other diphthongs. In terms of the prosody, the things like pitch, intonation, the sounds of how we're making these sounds, um, a lot of what we know about this is determined through poetry. So as we mentioned in previous lectures, a lot of Old English writings were either poetic or they were translated from things like Latin. So we don't always have as much information about the prosody that would have been found in everyday language, but the poetry can give us some inter interesting information about things like stress and timing of syllables. Um, so Old English inherited the Germanic verse tradition, and this was based more on alliteration and a stress timed line rather than counting syllables, which is something we typically do in poetry now. And so alliteration was really what held the lines together, and it was these alliterated syllables that took the major stress and gave us the kind of poetic verse that we see in Old English. So the time elapsing from one line to the next would have been the same amount of time regardless of the number of syllables, because it was more about the stress timing than it was about the syllables that were there. And so this gives us a really good way to help identify where major stresses were in Old English through this verse. Um, and it also shows us that a lot of the stress patterns do still correspond pretty well with the stress that we see in present day English. And when we're looking at the ways that the stress is working in poetry, you'll notice that the root syllable is what took the major stress. So if there were additional affixes that were being added, it was the root that was still using the major stress. So to give just a quick example of this, um, you'll notice that the accented symbols, syllables, um, are underlined and the alliterating sounds are in bold. And so this shows us an example from Beowulf where the monster Grendel is being described. And so you'll notice in the first line you have grim, gas, grend. And so you see that the g, g, g sounds are what is alliterated and where the poetry is coming from. Ma, me, mo. So the M sound in the second line, fen, fa, fi, in, so the f in the third line, wan, where, where, um, so the W in the fourth line, and then it's a sh sound in that fifth one, so shithan, shif, for shifren, so that sh sound that we see. And you'll notice that in for shifren, um, that it's not in the first syllable, but it is in the root syllable. So as we mentioned there, so it's not always syllable initial if there's something additional added to that, but the, the root is going to hold that stress pattern. So that gives us an idea of the kinds of things we see in phonology during the Old English time period. And so The Old English Language From the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle Here Martianus and Valentinus on thing on Rice, and Rixedon see of winter, and on here a dagum, Hengis and Horsa, from Wirt Jorna Yelavade, 
a bretta kuninge, ye sokt on bretne on tham stede that is ye nemnid upwinnes flaut. Erest bretum to fultime, ak hier eft on hier fuchtum. 